spoilers? Oh, lots and lots of spoilers. Hey ho, let's go to a land of leather and safety pins where plaid is for pants and the only doctor you should care about is Doc Martin. We're punking out, rocking against the man, whoever he is, and thrashing our way through another movie in our series, Semi-Real People, the biopic story. Welcome to Max Mike Movies, if you somehow haven't been welcomed before. <clears throat> we are the two railing against social injustice through the power of our rocking. Your, Oi! your lead singer over there is our very own two-tone Lamont, Mosh Pit Max Levine. <laughs> Anarchy! Anarchy! It's not doing it for me. I'm done. Okay. Uh, and I am your snarly <laughs> bass player, the fish with two legs, Madman Mike Luce. We are not wild stallions. We're just two guys who don't have a band. But nope. we nope. have a podcast. How many people can nope. say that? A lot, oh, really. Shut up. All right. The movie. This week, we're stage diving into that raucous rock and roll romp, Sid and Nancy. But first... I'd like to apologize. It's been a long time since I've had to do that, but I would like to apologize. When choosing this movie, it never occurred to me that it would be basically um, unviewable. It's not currently on any streaming service. It is not rentable from anywhere I could find. So if you're trying to keep up and don't already own this movie somehow, Max is very sorry. I mean, I am very sorry. You can get it on DVD from Netflix. Yes. So uh, we won't do it again for... A while, probably. <laughs> but hey, still before we get a move on, we have some answers to last week's poll question. Mm. That question, if you all remember, was, have you ever walked out on a movie? And if so, what was it? And why did you walk out? We've got some answers here, and I would like to you thank do. our dear dear listeners for providing them. The first up is thank Ned. Thank you! <laughs> That's exactly what they want. Uh, first up is Ned, who tells us, Oh gosh, a movie I've walked out of. There's only one movie I've ever done that to, and that was The Dictator, that Sasha Barra Cohen vehicle. I didn't walk out because it was bad. I walked out because my sister and I were taken to see it by my grandmother when we were 10 and 8 years old, or around that age anyways. Oh yeah. You can imagine how shocked we were by some of the stuff said. I keep meaning to go back and watch it, but at this point it's actually a running joke between me and my grandmother. <laughs> So thank you, Ned. That was a good story. Uh, <laughs> it's like when uh, Tyler and I went to went to see uh, Team America, and in the first eight minutes of the film, a man and his had to drag his screaming eight year old son out of the film because somehow he missed the giant R on the poster. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe Ned's grandmother thought it was the Great Dictator, the Charlie Chaplin movie. I d maybe don't know. Uh, next up, we hear from Val. She says, no, she hasn't. Huh. Okay. Uh, well. <laughs> but she's very particular about her films. So, Vince, and one of our other uh, longtime listeners, and also our international listener, just like the coffee. Uh, or, the house of, or the House of Pancakes. They're in, yes, with their hodls of coffee. Uh, I must have walked out of a movie at some point, but I cannot remember ever doing it. I did have to stop watching In a Glass Cage on VHS because it was so intense. Something was going to happen involving a singing child and a knife, and me and my ex, Toby, just could not watch it. We did finish it the next day. It was a great film, but man... He almost walked out of The Messenger and would have if his friend Scott hadn't stood up, addressed the other ten people in the audience, took out his lighter and said, if we just burn her now, we don't have to watch the rest of this movie. And others started yelling, burn her, burn her, so we spent the rest of the movie making running commentary. Later, Vince recalled that he did actually walk out of The Human Centipede. Good for if him. Know, if you know nothing about this movie, I beg you to not look it up. I, I cannot be more serious. It's like um, uh, the Hein uh, Wilhelm scream. Just once, no, the whole idea of it, just don't. Lastly, we have Dave, who tells us he walked out of a movie called The Ruling Class because it was, quote, all talk and no point, though he did enjoy the song about the plums. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I don't know what that means, but it does something to him. Uh, how about you, Max? Have you ever walked out of a film? Oh, boy. Well, we've talked about some of this in the past. I had to be taken out of a film when I was four or five years old, because we went to see Yellow Submarine and the Blue Meanies scared me. Uh -huh. uh, turns the uh, I had to walk out of Cloverfield for a while. Oh, that's right, because it was the 
shaky cam was literally making me ill. I came yeah. back in and sat in the back and watched the rest of it. Uh, in terms of like just being so disgusted with a movie or couldn't st- couldn't take it, uh, no, I don't think I've ever walked out. Yeah, Cloverfield, if I remember correctly, was shot by strapping a video camera to the back of a monkey, yeah. throwing bananas onto the set and letting it do whatever it wanted, right? That, that was probably, actually, I believe it was an orangutan, but yeah, pretty much. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. What about you? You ever walked out of a movie? No, I have tried twice. I tried one of them was only a couple of weeks ago, uh, our, our film of the week, uh, Highlander 2. <laughs> but, uh, our friends wouldn't let me. They said stay and make fun of it. The other... And the only reason I didn't walk out is because I didn't drive, and my other friends strangely wanted to see how it came out, was Dune. Oh. And this would be the 1980-whatever version with Sting. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, who played Paul Atreides in that film? Oh, um, Kyle MacLachlan. Kyle MacLachlan, yeah, amongst a cast of whatever. Yeah, um, an amazing cast. Just absolutely incomprehensible script, and of course, the the sweaty hand of Dino De Horrendous all over it. <laughs> But you know what's fun to watch? Sand. That's really fun to watch, in case you're interested in, in a film like that. So, Although it uh, is coarse and gets everywhere. That's true. And especially the Vaseline. Anyway, uh, with all that said, we have a new poll question for yeah. this week. So please respond via the site, email, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, and we'll tell you how to do that or later. Or text Mike. He loves that. Oh, God, please <laughs> don't text Mike. Or Max. Max's number is... Okay. So... The poll question for this week is, what movie did you dislike on first viewing that on later viewings you ended up liking? Give us an answer we'd love to hear from you, and we'll use your answers on the show. But now, finally, we get to trivia. The show. And for the people who have already forgotten what the film is for this week, it's Sid and Nancy. Right, right. Um, That's the one based on the comic strip, right? Uh... That's Nancy and Sluggo. Oh, oh. You're right. close. Okay. So Sid and Nancy. Uh, budget, $4 million. Wow. <laughs> Take, $2.8 million. Oh, oh boy. boy. Yeah, and it's actually kind of understandable why it was not a big Hollywood success story, but we'll get into that. Uh, in a bout of method acting, lead Gary Oldman... Subsisted on a diet of steamed fish and melon to achieve that, quote, heroin chic, end quote, look, which worked out great until he had to be hospitalized for malnutrition. <laughs> God, he looks like he's, he weighs about 40 pounds in this movie. Yeah. Uh, and that chain and lock around Gary Oldman's neck in the film? That was the real thing. That was Ooh. Sid Vicious's actual necklace given to him to wear by his mother. <laughs> That's not at all creepy, because, of course, Sid Vicious mm. is dead. <clears throat> Uh, The last scene of Sid and Nancy alone before her death, spoiler, was improvised between the two main actors. Wow. I suppose it's not much of a spoiler since it's literally the first scene in the film, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oldman, not at all a fan of either the script or punk music, did this one totally for the money, a cool 37,000 quid. (laughs) He claims not to have liked his performance in the movie at all. He said he didn't think he did a very good job. According to one of the real-life Sex Pistols, John Lydon, a.k.a. Johnny Rotten, I'm sorry, Johnny Rotten, the only thing the movie got right was the name Sid. He also claims that he was only brought on after the movie was completed and that his name was just being used to bring a sense of truth to the film or sincerity or what have you. According to the director Alex Cox, however, John Lydon was drunk during their meetings and did not remember them. Uh. <laughs> so, Wow, Johnny Rotten was drunk? I'm shocked. Shocked, I'll I- tell you. <laughs> It's hard to believe. Hard Hard to to believe. believe, In a move one would not generally describe as brilliant, the scene of Sid and Nancy shooting each other with cap guns was shot outside New Scotland Yard (laughs) without telling them. Soon enough, there were sharpshooters, a helicopter, and a lot of explaining to do. There's a lot of explaining to do. (laughs) Yeah, the the English aren't quite as cavalier about guns as we are. Uh, They're illegal. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, there is not a single actual Sex Pistols or Sid Vicious song in the soundtrack. I couldn't find out why, but that is, in fact, the truth. Uh, this was Gene Siskel's favorite movie of 1986. Okay. Gene, Gene was stab- in a bad place, I guess. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, 
The uh, stabbing scene is just conjecture at best, as the only eyewitness was likely not in his right mind. Instead, it's written as to it's more to be like an anti-drug statement, which at which I think it excels very, very well. Um, yeah. Though we're not told much of this uh, when this film takes place, Nancy dies in October 1978. Sid Vicious would die of a drug overdose the following February. Uh, this may be a, a big surprise to you, Max, but uh, Sid Vicious is not his real name. The what? <laughs> no, <laughs> he was not he was, Chris yeah, Sid Mr. And, Mr. and Mrs. Joe and Barbara Vicious, the Viciouses <laughs> of Kent. <laughs> no, actually. Oh. Um, uh, his real name was Simon John Ritchie. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Sid played with the Sex Pistols for less than three years. His bass playing is only heard partially on one track of their single and only studio album. <laughs> huh. um, and that little inexplicable cab scene at the end, uh, no mm. idea. The real Vicious uh, would be arrested for assault later in 1978, would be sent to Rikers Island for rehab, and die of an OD in February of 1979. And we'll talk about the little cab scene very soon. Yeah. Uh, do you know of any other trivia of this film? Uh, only that, uh, the, and this is one of the only Sid Vicious songs I knew, which is, weird, which is his weird yet oddly compelling cover of Frank Sinatra's My Way. That's yes. Gary Oldman singing. Yeah, uh, snarl when you say that. Snar yeah, excuse me, <laughs> snarling. Yeah. But, uh, and, and he friggin' nails it. I it's, was really surprised when I read later that it wasn't uh, the Sid Vicious. It wasn't Sid Vicious doing the vocals in the movie. Nope. Yeah, uh, he has an album. I actually meant to look it up and I didn't get a chance to. Is he put out an album called Sid Sings? <laughs> Except uh, no, he, not he. He really doesn't. Well, <laughs> it's singing of a kind. Sure, <laughs> I mean it's not full on shattering, but it is <laughs> singing. I always, whenever I listened to. Uh, Sid Vicious, or quite honestly, the Sex Pistols, I was reminded of a quote from Doonesbury where Uncle Duke is talking about Greg Allman of the Allman Brothers. He mm. said, Nephew, Greg Allman doesn't, Greg Allman's band doesn't so much make music as they emit a series of sounds that can sterilize frogs at 200 <laughs> yards. <laughs> is that nice? <laughs> I don't think that's nice. All right. Uh, I could just say this is a movie about the life of Sid Vicious, but that's too easy. And quite honestly, if you don't know anything about the Sex Pistols, you might want to know a little more. So I came up with this little uh, ditty, which I'm about to sing to you. So what, oh. can I get a C? Fl no, I, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> that, thank you. I believe I'm in tune. All right. The plot of Sid and Nancy. This movie starts with the death of the titular Nancy. T. We see a drugged out Sid Vicious, her boyfriend, staring off into space, unable to reply to police inquiry. He's arrested and thrown in jail. And then the screen gets all wobbly. <laughs> and we're back a couple of years earlier with Sid and the lads of the Sex Pistols. It's the punk scene in England, and man, are things messed up. Sid and Johnny Rotten are two peas in a pod, angrily, drunkenly staggering through life. Along comes Nancy Spungen, a wannabe groupie from the States obviously trying to get into Sid's pants. He ignores her until he sees her later being treated badly by a different punk band. Feeling sorry for her, he starts dating her, and that's when the fun and drugs start. We see the two get addicted to heroin, and spiral out of control as the band splits apart, then Vicious tries unsuccessfully to trade on his limited fame, and finally the two are left to barely exist in their wretched little apartment in the Hotel Chelsea, which they neatly set fire to, but somehow managed to not get hurt in or thrown out of. Life at this point is moments of arguable consciousness between hits of heroin until Nancy, who can't take it anymore, begs Sid to enact a joint suicide pact she's made him promise to earlier in the film. Sid's decided, not for the first time, that he's going to instead get clean and move back to London. In a struggle with a knife, it accidentally goes off, leaving Nancy with a slowly hemorrhaging stomach wound. Their fight over, naturally, the two just fall asleep. Nancy gets up later, realizing something is wrong, manages to make it to the, both the bathroom and the beginning of the film. She dies. In jail, Sid can't really give an account of what happened as he wasn't really there, there. He's bailed out by... Someone gets a pizza, dances with some nice kids in the street, and is picked up by a cab with what looks like his dead girlfriend in the backseat, and they drive off to who's no, who knows where at the end. Hello, down. So, uh, first off, I want to just give a little uh, thing about punk rock 
in case people don't know, they think they know what punk rock is. Uh, in the mid 70s, this is a music that stemmed from a style of 60s rock that was originally called punk rock, but eventually had to be retitled garage rock because they anyway, it would take a scientist. <laughs> Uh, it's a very do-it-yourself, short and fast style music that is more about the music and less about the perceived excesses of other music of the time. Uh, specifically, I remember reading that Johnny Rotten hated the fact that things like Simon and Garfunkel were called rock and roll, which, to be fair, it's not. Mm. Uh, it often had political and anti-establishment messages in the lyric, and it's been described as, quote, rock and roll by people who didn't have very many skills as musicians, but still felt the need to express themselves through music, end quote. So... That's what this is about. Uh, I, do, I do have to take slight exception to what you say about Sid Vicious's limited fame. Sid Vicious, at least in England, was, ma was very well known, especially on the London scene. He was fam The Sex Pistols were really famous. But not in the States, which is no, where he the, was. In the States, which is where he ends up, that's true. In the States, they were somewhat known. It still gets me at one point we're seeing that they're, they're on tour in the States, and they're clearly in the Midwest or the Southwest because there's guys they're, with cowboy hats in the they're audience. In Texas. They're in Texas. Yeah. Which I cannot picture. I just like cowboy hats at a Sex Pistols concert. That just doesn't... There's serious cognitive dissonance there. Yeah. Um, the, I, I was amazed that they just weren't thrown out, but there was obviously some kids who enjoyed it, but it was funny because they obviously didn't know how to enjoy it. Like They're kind of bopping with the beat, but it's like there's no mosh pit, there's no people spitting or throwing things. Which is honestly how the audiences of punk music tended to show their appreciation. Yeah, they, to show appreciation, the bands they liked, they would spit on them. Yeah. Yeah, and you see that in this. Had you seen this before? No, I'd never seen it. So this was another one of those darlings of the repertoire movie house circuit or the art house movie circuit. I remember this playing at the Harvard Square many times. Like This would come through lots and lots. Um, and... I didn't know why, I just knew it was one of those films that the locals liked. Um, I suppose you were supposed to break in and you would have booze with you or something when you watched it, but uh, it was one of those films and I just never got around to seeing it. Till now. Um, let, let's start off with some of the performances. Gary Oldman, more like Gary Youngman, am I right? I think he's literally <laughs> 10. <laughs> Yeah, this was a very early thing for this was really kind not I don't know if I'd call it his breakout, but it did bring him to the attention of a lot of people. Yeah, as well it should have. Now I know he didn't like his uh performance in this, but I gotta say, you just add it to the grand repertoire that is Gary Oldman, and it's just another facet of look at what this guy can do. Um, Even looking at it on its own, it's a remarkable performance. He really, he gets across both the how lost and how the the the, the despair in uh, in Sid, but also there's a there's an element of him that you get the feeling under there somewhere is a kind of nice guy, or yeah. could have been, or some such. You know, the guy Maybe. likes his mother. Doesn't want to upset her. When Johnny's yelling at him to spray paint a dog, he won't do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's so much to get through before you even can touch what may or may not be the real Sid Vicious or, you know, Simon Ritchie. Um, and, of course, you get to see all of those layers because they, they, they start with drunk and angry and they soon go from drunk and angry to literally pissed out of his mind and playing to oh gosh isn't heroin such a neat thing i'm nearly unintelligible and there's like these very few moments of clarity and one of them sadly is at the end of the film i think we actually get a moment where sid is about as clear as he's been for the entire film and it's when he's telling nancy no i won't commit suicide with you i'm gonna go get clean and go back to london because this is ridiculous um yeah i don't know if it's because she, there's, yeah, the there's sad, literally too much time between hits or what but the sad part is she, what she points out because she's you know you can argue that he was dragging him down but she says you're never going to get clean. You say that every single day. Yeah. And that happens with a lot of uh, junkies, with a lot of addicts. They want to get clean. They just, they can't or they don't. Yeah. Uh, there, I would have to say, though, that the way it's portrayed at that moment made me feel that this time he actually 
was more serious. I won't say that he was going to do it, but it felt like a he believed it at that moment. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. One of the complaints that Johnny Rotten had about this movie was that it glorified heroin <laughs> use. So, Max, like, I'd like to ask you: Would you say that this film glorifies heroin use? Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I gotta say, e- even if I if I had had any even vague interest in heroin before seeing this movie, which I never have because bleh, needles, but yeah. it, this movie would make me go never. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I want to even say when I, my one of my first notes was it doesn't even glorify punk culture, right? Because when you see punks just being punks, it's just they're angry at everything. And I'm not saying that they didn't have reason. Apparently, the politics in uh, 70s Britain and 80s Britain were particularly bad. Yeah, um, this is what gave, gave rise to Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism. Yeah, England was in a really bad state economically at the end of the 70s and the early 80s. And Thatcher didn't really help, not to mention wasting about three billion pounds on an absolutely pointless war over sheep in the Falklands. Yeah. Uh, and th- there was... Uh, th- unemployment was at a staggering high, and there was just a lot of disillusionment and a lot of despair. And a, yeah. it brought brought about a very angry generation. It was It's kind of a backlash to the 60s. The 60s were a time when they were saying, ah, oh, the revolution is coming. We're going to overthrow the fascists. going to overthrow the old order. Didn't happen. No. Turned no. Yeah. And it's, punk culture is people with young people with all of this anger and a lot of cases, nothing to do with it except to just lash out at whatever is nearby. And that's what you see here. I would say that it it probably does pull some punches because, you know, maybe the punk culture was even nastier than we see. But. If you're as, you know, pure and white bread as I am, it sure feels like an area I don't want to go to ever or think about. Um, this is one scene where these school kids are getting out of out of school and it looks like they're junior high kids. And all of them pass this one car and they just hit it because mm. like it. And I think those kids aren't even angry yet. It's just that's what they learn because their their older siblings or the punks do that. They they bash things. They break nice things. You can't have nice things. <laughs> and. It's just all of this anger, and the punk bands are people who at least grabbed an instrument before smashing it on stage <laughs> and lashed out with music and tried to just express themselves. Now, I'm not saying that punk music is the best thing in the world. I'm not, it's not my cup of tea for the most part, but I understand it. I get it. Um, and actually, some of my uh, close friends are the people you'd look at them and just punk music would not be the first thing you would think of. And they love punk music. <laughs> like, you know, the whole, you know, the, the Sex Pistols and uh, all that stuff. Um, yeah. Dead Kennedys. Did you, uh, when you were young, did you ever listen to the Sex Pistols or any of the, the punk movement? I still haven't. Well, to be fair, the Ramones, although it's funny, yeah. the Ramones, which are actually apparently were very influential to people oh, like huge. the sex people. They, they were huge. If you listen to the Ramones, like, they're really not that radical. I mean, you've got songs like Blitzkrieg Bop and Beat on the Brat and stuff, but it's like... KKK I've, took my baby away? I've heard those songs in the supermarket. <laughs> Which is just weird. And I'm sure that because they're all dead, that's the only reason that that happens. But I'm sitting there going through trying to figure out which, you know, brand of bread I'm going to buy. And it's like, beat on the bread, beat on the bread, beat on the bread with a baseball bat. Oh, yeah. Please help me. I do want the oat bread. <laughs> so, I oh, know. I got to pick up some beer soaked brats. That's right. Yeah. It's just bizarre. Um, uh, it, we were talking about Gary Oldman. Yeah. Gary Oldman weighs about 10 pounds. Um, He's got the snarl down. He's got the, I don't know what you'd call it. The, I can barely understand him. Th- the slur down. Yeah, yeah. It's just that was one of my problems with the movie. I had a lot of trouble understanding what anybody was saying. <laughs> Actually, about 20 minutes in, I switched to put in my headphones because it's like, I literally can't hear you. What did you say? And of course, I felt like, what? What's the punk saying? I yeah. can't hear it. No. Yeah, I don't Even- know if it's the mixing or if it's my hearing is going or, or what. I got to tell you, with the headphones, didn't help that much. Oh, Wow. <laughs> And it could be anybody. It wasn't even necessarily um, Gary Oldman. No, with it was all of them. Um, uh, what did you think of Chloe Webb as Nancy Spungen? Oh, I thought she she did a really good job. She gets a little cartoonish at times, a little over the top, 
But she does this great job of portraying this. I mean, it's clear that re- regardless of the drugs, Nancy's not a nice person. No. I mean. Well, a- I, she- I don't know if I'd say that she's not a nice person. I think she literally dislikes herself that much. Which is funny because that's what they say about Johnny Rotten when she says, I don't think Johnny likes me. And Sid says, Johnny doesn't like anybody. It's like, yeah. really? A guy who calls himself Johnny Rotten doesn't like people? I'm shocked. <laughs> Oh, you know, I think I'm going to let my daughter go out with this nice uh, rotten fellow. He seems no, I, so, such a nice I, guy. I, I thought uh, Chloe Webb did a really good job. I mean, because Nancy is both pitiful and horrible. And uh, the worst part is utterly believable. One of the mm. most awkward and awful scenes is when they're, she and she brings Sid home to her <laughs> grandparents. Did you recognize the grandfather, by the way? The grandfather looked really familiar. Who was that? It is I, Marilyn Hinkle. Oh no! From the uh, oh, <laughs> from, from tape heads. Oh god! I didn't. This catch is my that. last will and testament, Marilyn Hinkle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And don't so forget it's... to pay video aces. You get a lot for your money. I gotta go to sleep now. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry. Oh you bring, god! Bring some... This obviously incredibly generic uh, uh, suburban family, and they're looking at. You know their 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 daughter or their grand their granddaughter, who has brought home this strange insect. Who is real? Because Sid is at the table with his spiked hair and he's not wearing a shirt. You can see he's covered in scars, and yeah. yet oddly he's trying to sort of be polite. You know, although he can't remember the name, so he refers to Mister Grandpa, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice what he was constantly shown holding? Uh, he had a bottle of something, didn't he? It was peppermint schnapps. Oh, Lord. I mean, it'll do the job, uh, but man, Halloween should only come once a year. I'm uh, just saying. <laughs> um, and just it, by then. And it's just none of them. The the I guess who's the, the younger sister is clearly yeah. kind of intrigued by by Sid, but all the rest, it's like this alien has landed. And they, they don't know what to do, and they're but it's clear that it's her they're afraid of. They don't like her. No. And the grandparents don't want her in the house. They don't want her to sleep there. They don't want her to visit any more than she absolutely has to. Sid is sort of just like an accessory. It's clear whatever was up with her, it happened a long time before she left. Well, you remember this is one point where she claims to have gotten married to Sid and she's calling her mother and yeah. saying that we need money for the, uh, or they want a present for the uh, honeymoon. The wedding, yeah. And she finally gets down to the point where she's just begging for money. And I got to just, just to let you know that there is dialogue. You can kind of hear it, but it's utterly out of sync. Like they added it later and it's really just the mother going, no, I'm not going to send you any money. There's not really anything to be learned there. Um, but the mother obviously has heard this before well, and probably didn't even know her daughter was in London. I, I did um, like that line, you know, Nancy's screaming. They just said, they said, we just spend it on drugs. And Sid goes, we would. <laughs> it's like, at least he's honest about it. Oh yeah. God. And that sequence where she smashes the window of the phone booth, you know, where right. she's just so upset. That was, by the way, that was a mistake. One pane in that phone booth was candy glass. She was supposed yeah. to break it, but she got so carried away, she smashed the real glass. And she yeah. was really lucky she didn't cut herself to pieces. No, especially because there's a scene later in a film where Sid goes through a door by accident yeah. and does get cut into pieces, which yeah. is generally what happens when one falls through a, a yeah. piece of glass. But that's, again, um, that's a really painful scene because she's just losing it. She's clearly... They're both in withdrawal. They just desperately need money. She's begging them to her to, her mother to send her money to the American Express office, you know, right away. Because yeah, they need a fix. Mm. And it's clear, even though you can't tell what the mother is saying, is she's heard this before, and she's not having it. No. Um, the, a lot of the other performances are really blinking. You'll kind of miss them. Uh, the guy who plays Johnny Rotten or John Lydon, uh, Andrew Schofield. Uh, he got a lot of criticism from Johnny Rotten because he's like, the guy doesn't know anything about who I am or how to play me. I look, just look like, I think he said something like, I just look like some fat git eating beans. <laughs> yep. Um, and to be fair, you really don't learn anything about Johnny Rotten. He's barely there, except in the beginning, it's obvious he and Sid are thick as thieves. Like, 
I actually kind of wondered, are they suggesting that those guys in a drunken stupor might have actually done something? I doubt mm-hmm. it, but um, they're they're almost like brothers at one point. But uh, the film does not really focus on the Sex Pistols at all. I mean, not least of which because there's none of their songs in the film. Um, but we really don't get a sense of two things to me. We don't get a sense of the Sex Pistols as a band. We see a little of them on tour, and they're very energetic, and I'm sure they can excite a teenage crowd very easily. But we don't really get why they want Sid in the band. They explain it to us. But unfortunately, we see Sid, like, we we literally have opened the door on a conversation where the best lines have just ended. And... Um, cause I looked into this and apparently, uh, they, they, they picked up Sid because they didn't like the previous bass player at the time. Sid didn't play the bass at all. Ah. Uh, he was literally chosen because of his looks and his attitude and his charisma. He was the face of the punk movement. Um, but when he was told, dude, you can't play the bass. He did what Sid would do. He took speed, stayed up all night with a bass guitar and a Ramones album, and according to two separate sources, the next morning he could play bass. <laughs> so yeah. he um, had apparently what he did have presence. He had stage presence. He had charisma. Yeah, he was there to be sort of the face of the band. But yeah, we don't get much of a. This is another movie. It reminds me of Chaplin in some ways. We don't get a lot of. Uh, depth to it. We don't really... We see what he does. We don't know why. We don't get an idea of what disaffected him so much. Specific, was there anything specific? You know, why don't we ever... We never see his mom, although apparently he lives in her house for quite a while. Right. Uh, I, and, you know, your your line right there, we see a lot of what but not why, that's literally one of my notes. Um, but I said, actually, I thought it was more the opposite of Chaplin, because in Chaplin, we got a lot of facts without getting to know the person that well. And here we get to know a lot about this era of Sid Vicious very well, but don't know any of the facts behind it, including the dates. Like, we don't see a date in this film. I was trying to guess, is this the 80s? What's going on? And not till the end of the film. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. This all took place up until 1979. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize it was so early, but. What got me about the movie, and I don't know, this was a strange choice, I think, of the director, is there are these odd, surreal, um, almost imaginative segments that just pop in into the parts of intense, even painful reality. And it's very hard to tell the transitions. Uh, the, uh, I mean, even little things like when this group of toddlers is beating up another kid because he owes them $3.00. And they and he, Sid interferes. They say, "Who who who do you think you are?" And he looks at him and goes, "Sid Vicious." And they run away, but they speed up the film, so they're running away like cartoons or like in a Benny Hill uh, segment. I was going to say, if you'd been wearing headphones, you would have heard Yakety Sax. No, it's not really. <laughs> I mean, there's it that. is strange. Like I don't. I had that in my notes. To why is that there? Why did yeah. they speed up the film? Or the the first time it happens, it's a little thing, but it's so odd. It's after the Texas show when these guys are beating up Sid mm-hmm. and the manager, Malcolm, shows up and he points his fingers at them like he's holding a gun and you hear a gun bolt being drawn and you hear the sound of a gun firing, but he's not holding a gun. But they react like he is. Yeah. And that just baffled me. I was like, is this supposed to be Sid's perception? Like he was so zoned out that he... he didn't see a gun he just heard it or, yeah. and then the whole my way segment mm-hmm. where he's like shooting the audience and i was like is this supposed to be a video he's yeah, shooting that's... and that's why everyone starts sitting up at the end and t- but no it's just a thing and it's it, i don't know i that part of the movie didn't work for me because it doesn't fit the rest it and this leads into the final segment right he's, which he's, is literally, like I said, he goes and gets a pizza. He sees some nice kids that say, dance with us. And he does. And then a, a and pristine, I don't disco, know where they got the this. It was a, it was a pristine, huh. um, checker marathon. Oh, I love pulls those. up. <laughs> and in the back is wearing what's could be construed Looks like as a, a wedding. wedding dress is, is, uh, Nancy. You and know, just died. Right. And she says, get in the car and they go driving off. Um, I, 
they, I was waiting for the car to literally drive into the sky because it's like, are they suggesting that now he dies? Which is, you know, not what happened. Because um, actually he would attempt suicide twice between the time that she died and his eventual OD, which his mother claims was a suicide because she found a note in his leather jacket. Um, interestingly, uh, when it was uh, time to bury Sid, no funeral home would take him. No, they, they were and afraid uh, the embalming chemicals would make him explode. I don't, they just didn't like the whole, like, we don't like this guy, we uh, don't like what he represents, which, okay. Um, wow. He was supposed to be buried, he wanted to be buried next to Nancy. Uh, and then the mother um, contacted her parents and said, look, Sid, can I have him cremated and then sprinkle Sid over Nancy's grave? And they were like, no. <laughs> uh, she did it anyway. Uh, that, um, the, yeah, but there was, you know... The extra, a few part, extra months, yeah. but... There's an odd thing, and I, I realized this fairly... You know, I didn't realize this until today. In the movie, we are never told that Nancy is dead. I mean, we see a body being taken out, she's, and, you know, she is covered the way they do. Yeah. But we're not really... It, no one ever says it. So I, I thought maybe this whole thing is the idea at the end it's a delusion of Sid's, and he's convinced himself that she's not dead. Well... I mean, let's be fair. When we see the accidents, so what happens is they have a fight. She wants him to commit suicide with her. She's tired. She's like, I can't face this anymore. And quite honestly, it's about as low as you're going to get. They're living in this terrible little slum apartment. Um, I have no idea when the last time they went outside was. They have somebody bringing them drugs. Where they get the money, I, I can't yeah. even guess at this point. And it's all heroin, so it's nothing. There's no good side of this. It's just literally they're getting the heroin to not feel absolutely horrible. And she's like, "I'm done." And they had bought a knife. There was a scene showing them buying a knife. They have a fight, and you can see at one point that he's not trying to stab her so much as there's a struggle. He's got the knife in the hand, and either he trips forward or she trips forward onto it. But it's it's not obvious well you know what happens but it's not obvious how it happened and then right after that because probably because they're still either dealing with the withdrawal symptoms or whatever they're just like they both calm down and they literally take a nap yeah. <laughs> and they get into bed and they take a nap you, you blood's all over the place she gets up hours later or i don't know how much later but later later and the whole bed's covered in blood and she's like gets to her feet which i'm like really um manages to get to the bathroom and his blood is leaking everywhere and she's sort of like wow i think something's wrong <laughs> and she just and calls out when, in that famous you know says sid sid and that's it yeah and sid is still asleep yeah uh, well um, as to the getting up if they were actually on heroin although i'm still not sure if they were just going through withdrawal first and foremost heroin's a painkiller you could walk around if you're if you're uh, chasing the dragon or riding the white tiger or whatever the hell else you call it Beating the melon? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, pantsing the weasel. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry, wheeze. Yeah. The, uh, you know, and uh, you won't know that you've been fatally wounded. because uh, uh, Maybe that's what it is. I know nothing about it. I barely know how to spare, spell it. I have to keep leaving the E off the uh. end. Um, <laughs> I, it's so yeah i you know i maybe that was what it was maybe it was meant to to be maybe all those moments are meant to be him hallucinating except that they're done so badly and so suddenly that it just makes you go what why is oh maybe you're trying to provide some humor in this otherwise incredibly uh, dire and depressing film I, maybe it's yeah I don't know. some of the uh imagery in the film is not exactly subtle. I mean, the two of them, that, that the iconic shot, or I guess you almost the, the one that was trying to be iconic, the one they use for the poster, where they're kissing next to a dumpster, and garbage is literally falling out of the sky onto them. Yeah. It's like, hmm, what am I supposed to be taking away? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, let's face it. There's very little about the punk scene that was, shall we say, subtle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as is usual in the case, uh, there's some stuff I, I dug out. Uh, not a lot. There really was not a lot about Sid Vicious's life, that, except for him being in the band. Uh, but there was a few choice facts that I was like, well, this is kind of interesting. Why don't we know about this? Um, 
for example, he knew Chrissy Hind of the Pretenders before oh. she formed the band. And in fact, she tried to convince him to fake a marriage between her and he so that she could get a work permit and stay in England. Oh. Huh. And then lucky for her, it didn't happen. And she would, in fact, go on to form the Pretenders. Uh, he also played drums for Susie and the Banshees. I knew he had some he was, connection to Susie and the Banshees. Yeah. yeah, before he ever would be in the Sex Pistols, he played the drums. There's wow. no mention of any of that. <laughs> Both of which were obviously much more successful bands than, you know, he would be on his own or um, potentially, I guess, the Sex Pistols, because, of course, they kept making music and the other and Sex Pistols broke up. Um, then, also, then they got back together. In real life, we see it's Nancy who shows up, because up till now... Um, Sid is just on the booze. It's it's good and wholesome booze, and you know that's fine. And it's Nancy who shows up and gets him to start uh, taking drugs with her. Uh, do you know who in real life it was the, was that uh, got him hooked on drugs? Who Johnny? No, no I don't know. His mom. What? <laughs> yep. Ew. It was his mom. Creepy. Who was also, and they don't explain this when he gets bailed out at the end of the film. Yeah. We have no idea who bailed him out. It was his mom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Don't know why. The invisible she's mom, that. sure. Uh, yeah. Um, speaking of which, uh, we have a couple of uh, questions. I thought I might bring those up, uh, like last week's dumpster dive, um, <laughs> that we're asking about our biopics. Um, what do we know about Sid or and or Nancy from this movie? I would not want to share an apartment with either of them. <laughs> yeah. And I wouldn't want to go to a concert with either of them. Yeah. I mean, my feeling was we've le- we learned what it is to be that troubled a person, and Maybe. in that situation, um, I don't think we learn we- a lot about them. I think we learn about their lifestyle. I think we learn about their immensely bad choices in everything. Yeah, but I don't think we learn much about them as people. You know, again, we see nothing of the Sid Vicious that made people want to see him in concert. Because, like, there's two times we actually see him. There's one concert he doesn't even, he's not even on stage. The Sex Pistols are playing and Sid's in the bathroom. Um, But, like, the two times we see him playing, he is so either drunk or high off his horse. That's not a saying. No, it's Uh, really not. (laughs) He is so blitzed off his mind that he, we're not even sure he's actually playing. He's just sort of standing there drooling and slamming at the at the base every once in a while. So we don't actually see the fit Sid Vicious that they're talking about. Nancy, all we get is she's a, you know, starts off as being a groupie, um, a wannabe. And actually the early part of the, her performance, I really didn't care for very much. I thought it was a little bit too much. And she does sort of settle into something that I think is a lot more evocative. Although the one thing I have to ask is, I'm sorry, what, what does Sid see in her? Yeah. What is that, uh, that, that spark? <laughs> Cause I, I don't see it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Their, their relationship is puzzling. Yeah. I mean, eventually I think it's just need. Um, maybe he, she's the one who doesn't judge him for the drugs because she's too busy judging herself. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, how accurate was the uh, depiction, as far as you could tell? Well, from the little I had heard about it, not at all. I mean, I think the depiction of the lifestyle of the of uh, drug addicts is, the uh, heroin addicts is pretty good. I have yeah. no idea if it's an accurate depiction of Sid Vicious or the Sex Pistols. From according to Johnny Rotten and according to Rolling Stone and a couple of others, they got the spirit right, but all of the facts are wrong. Hmm. Yeah, even looking stuff up, there wasn't a lot to go by because the Sex Pistols literally were not around that long. And they weren't that heavily covered. You know, people no. didn't, yeah. That when you look at the bands of they may have been some of the earliest. They people argue they were some of the first, the the pioneers of punk, but when you look at some of them it's people pay more attention to the Clash or the Buzzcocks or a little later the Dead Kennedys. I think it's also fair to say that bands like The Clash, while not mainstream, were a little bit more palatable than some of the bands like um, The like, Sex Pistols. Well, the people in The Clash could actually play their instruments, for one thing. Well, and here's the thing. I don't actually mind that in, in a way, because it was they were lashing out. They were feeling that rock was getting too what's the word I want, uh, institutionalized. Uh, and there were things were getting too produced and too, 
perfect. And there were the, the term rock and roll was was being broadened to include a lot of stuff that it like, you know, if you were going to include people like John Denver, it's like Don, John Denver yeah. is not rock and roll. Yeah. Um, he's folk and that's fine, mm-hmm. but like if they felt like rock was originally a rebellious sort of thing and it had by the 70s lost all of that, all of its edge was gone and they were trying to bring it back. Um, and some bands I think were as I said a little bit more palatable to the average person than you know something like the Sex Pistols and some of that may have had to do with the fact that it was somebody who s- took speed stand up all night with a Ramones <laughs> album and that's how they learned how to play mm. um, I think it was accurate in a slice of punk life I can't tell how accurate it is to our subject which of course is the whole point but it felt if not accurate it didn't feel insincere if that makes sense. Mm. Except yeah. for those weird parts that you pointed out. Mm. <laughs> the Benny Hill segments, shall we say, of our <laughs> of our film. Uh, do we, and this course goes with the first question, but do we feel we get to know the subject, in this case, Sid and or Nancy, better after having watched the film? I guess. I didn't know anything about them to begin with. I knew very little initially. Yeah. We, we get some, we get a lot of surface stuff. We don't really see much below that. We don't see so much. We see the addiction and we see what, what it turns them into. We don't see them that much as people. There are hints of it here and there. I mean, you know, you get the, you do see some of, you know, Sid just wanting to be defiant and go against social convention and just tear everything down. But you don't see a lot. But I think you see some. Again, we don't know what it was in his life that he's railing against. And they don't explain the whole... Um, situation in England at the time. They're yeah. just like, oh, it's it's punk, that's what's going on. And to be fair, this film was made less than 10 years after he died, because he dies in 1979 and the film was made seven years later. So it's still pretty, you know, we've, we've already moved on into New Wave, and of course they've taken the edifice of punk, and quite honestly, they've monetized it. Yeah. And by, by now, by 1986, punk is gone. And anything that's left over is just the leather and the studs and the, and the safety pins and the... Mohawks, um, yep. yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do we know any more? Does anybody know any more about Sid Vicious? Probably Johnny Rotten does, but does he remember it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, who knows? That was part of the whole punk thing. Um, uh, just for those who don't know, there's one point, there's this one guy who's uh, part of Sid Vicious's pickup band i guess and he later he just says i think i'm gonna go back to being a rude boy i went to look up what that was mm. that was actually that's so was that was a person who was into jamaican yeah. ska street culture it's yeah. sort of like ska punks uh ska is the precursor to um oh dear gods it's very popular in boston um dubstep no i'm sorry as i'm thinking of ska ska is the oh. precursor of reggae oh that's i thought I thought talking. it was the other way around nope ska came oh. first okay um and now it's all called dance hall but uh, it was also people who were rude and threw things and stuff. Literally, rude boy. Um, although the term now also refers to people who are British and in, into punk, and it's you know it's broadened like everything else is. Um, uh, one one line from a previous film that we've talked about popped up, uh, which was "ugly, ugly people." <laughs> <laughs> it's from um, the Ramones uh, movie. Uh, what Rock is it with pu- what is it with punks and pizza? Oh, when uh, you know. When they're bringing over pizza and uh, 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 Sid is going, oh, yeah, I love this stuff. All I could think of is rock and roll high school and the robot, hey, pizza, hey, it's great. Hey, I want No pizza, <laughs> wheat germ, riboflavin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess it's one of the few foods you can eat quickly that actually gives you some kind of feeling of fullness when mm-hmm. you remember to eat because that's a thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's... It's a difficult film. I mean, we're really Ugh. just sort of thrown... Well, we're thrown into the death, because that's the beginning of the film. Yeah. Uh, but we're thrown into the punk lifestyle, and we the little bits we see of normal, average, everyday people are pretty wood-paneled and suburban-y. Um, and mostly it's like... I think it's used as a contrast. It's like, you know, how do these people not fit into society? Well, let's put them into this padded, <laughs> nice carpeted basement, and we'll show you. Um, I honestly don't understand how... Well, except, okay, to be fair, a lot of this takes place in New York City in the late 70s. New York City in the late 70s was an ugly place to be. Um, even into the 80s, because this is the point where uh, New York went bankrupt, right? I believe um, so. One of, t- 
one of one, two times. One of a it? couple of times, yeah. And yeah, so, no, it was in a ba- it was in a very bad state. You would have streets that were literally they looked like they were in a war zone, uh, burned out cars and uh, even brownstones, which now are worth billions of dollars. At that point, they had broken windows and stuff was just a mess. And so I was like, how could this possibly have happened? And it's like, well, because that's what they, the way the city looked back then. Uh, even in 86, when they shot it, I bet there were still p- plenty of parts of even Manhattan. Yeah, the big recovery look- hadn't, occurred, hadn't happened yet. No. Um, interestingly, I, I read a book by, but we're going to go way off topic, by Malcolm Gladwell. And he talks about the fact that one of the big turnarounds from New York came from not more cops, not more patrols, not stuff like that. It was literally doing things like patching up streetlights and patching up windows, making it look like people actually lived there. And that's what actually, this subtle thing actually had a huge impact on lowering the crime rate, as as weird as it might seem. But actually looking like somebody gave a crap about the area was enough to send some of that crime away. And once you got that started to go, luckily things like gentrification could come in and all the nice people who used to live in the in the neighborhood and help make them interesting could now be forced out because it was too expensive to live there which is what we're all aiming for isn't it yeah yeah so interesting um, idea yeah what else you got um (laughs) one part of this that made me really uncomfortable is when they adopt the cat okay i (laughs) want to bring up the cats I, i thought that was just a bad directorial idea because what happens when they bring in the cat? What did you do? I just started worrying about the cat more than I worried about the characters. Yep. I spent <laughs> the rest of the movie looking for it, listening yep. to it, when hoping the, it was okay. When they when the hot, when their apartment catches on fire and the firemen show up, I'm like, forget those two. Save the cat. <laughs> Where's the cat? Is the cat? Oh, oh, good, good. The cat's okay. And even yeah. at the end when the police are collecting him and they're taking him to jail and they're taking away Nancy's body and going... Who, who, who's going to take care of the cat? Yeah, I'm also wondering how did that cat survive? They did they ever remember to feed it? Well, and they and it just ate whatever they left on the floor, which would probably be quite a lot. That was yeah, honestly, I, maybe that was real. Maybe they did have a cat, but it was a problem in the film because immediately the, it becomes the cat becomes the most sympathetic character. It does. There's actually a scene, they're in a club somewhere, and somebody has a box of kittens, <laughs> and all I could think of was, please, anybody, take the box of kittens away from Nancy. No! Because it, it, Max is right. I, I just kept thinking about the cat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a cute cat! Yeah, it's, it's a, a nice little, It's a little tabby cat, yep. and it's like, well, later it has a little leather collar on, it's like, okay, yep. whatever. <laughs> but that's it. I'm only worried about the cat. We know what happens. We The whole film starts. She dies. Yep. Mm-hmm. We're not surprised. And we know Sid goes to jail. And it's like, I haven't heard any Sid Vicious albums lately, so even though I don't know for sure, I'm going to guess he doesn't make it very far out of this film either. Mm. So uh, here's a hint for directors. If you want people to care about your characters, don't have a cat in the movie. <laughs> unless it's Jones, and she takes it with her. <laughs> Right, unless they're unless they're nice to the cat, and the cat is integrated into the plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much all. That was the only other thing I had. Well, uh, we might as well get to uh, yeah. that ending part. But uh, yeah, the roundup. Max. So, what'd you think, Mike? This is a tough film. Um, it is not pretty. Um, I actually saw it before Max did, and I only I know when Max tends to watch the film, and I texted him and said, you might want to watch some Looney Tunes right after <laughs> this, or, you know, just maybe some Patton Oswalt, something happy, because it is, I don't, I, according to Johnny Rotten, who literally called this the Peter Pan version, ah, um, I don't think it pulls that many punches with the lifestyle, or the, um, the drug culture and because of that i think that it's really hard to watch and i think it's also again even if it's not factually accurate or is not as factually accurate as it could be my feeling is that it does a really good i mean it's it doesn't really just come right out and have nancy reagan pop up and go just say no (laughs) it really does the movie just says no yeah Um, and I, I don't think we see enough of what made Sid Vicious so charismatic. We really just see slobbering, jabbering out of his mind Sid Vicious. I don't see anything interesting 
or attractive about Nancy, but maybe that's part of the point. So I think it's a hard film to watch, but I think it's got some good performances, and because it doesn't shy away from the ugliness of addiction and the punk rock movement, I think it's an interesting film. I don't know that I'd recommend it just because it's so dark, and I don't think you really get a good idea of punk, but I think that the performances, let's just say that I think the performances are good. How about you? I would agree with that. I think it's uh, it's impressive for the performances. I think uh, both Chloe Webb and uh, Gary Oldman do incredible jobs. It is not an it's not a fun film. It's not an easy film to watch. It's very bleak, uh, but I, I think it covers its uh, subject pretty well. I think it's interesting to it's interestingly made. The it's one of those movies where you can see the director was taking a chance, was uh, sort of trying to stretch a bit. This is the same guy, by the way, who eventually did Repo Man. Mm. So probably his best known other. Probably film, yeah. uh, was it Alex Cox? Yep. So uh, I, I don't know how much I'd recommend that if you're a completist, if you seeing something about the punk movement or about the punk lifestyle, sure. But yeah, uh, I, I can't say I enjoyed it. I'd say it's probably one of the least Hollywood biopics I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but hey, you know, we've got some uh, business if you wouldn't uh, mind taking yes. care of that because Certainly. we want people to, to answer our poll question, Do. which if you've already forgotten is, is there a movie that you've seen where you didn't like it on initial viewing, but on later viewings you ended up liking it? And if you want to respond to us, Max, how would people do that? Why, they could do it any number of ways. Mike, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's my yep. job. You can email us at us at maxmikemovies.com. You can also go to our website, maxmikemovies.com, where our whole catalog of uh, backup issue, episodes and issues are, and you can leave a comment or a reply. You can also find us on social media, Facebook or Twitter, under Max Mike Movies. You can, you can post your uh, answer there. You, um, for listening, you can find us on the podcast app of your choice or on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many, many more. Hey, I wasn't paying attention. Did you say the email address? I did. I said it at the beginning. Oh, that was good. the first thing I said. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, Max is talking. I immediately just start thinking of, you know, Bozo the Clown <laughs> or Power yeah, Girls yeah, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, That's pretty much the effect I tend to have. Yep. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Max, uh, we're continuing our little series we next week, aren't we? Yes. So how are we continuing our little well, series Well, we're getting week? another titan of the bad boys of punk music. Okay, not at all. We're, but we are getting another... I don't, know, I don't know if you can call him a bad boy or not. We're getting another musician. We're go I'm going to have us watch Walk the Line, the Johnny Cash story. Is is it called that because that's what you have to do after you've been pulled over and have been drinking? That is, and that is exactly right. You have to walk the line, and then you have to touch yeah. your nose, and you have to say. Then you have to speak, say the alphabet backwards, skipping the vowels with your eyes closed, and giving the American Sign Language symbol for each letter. Well, I'd rather walk the line than sit on a ring of fire. But we'll find out how that goes next week, won't we? Uh, sure. This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench.